of 15 May. The time is now 7 p.m. Cindy, can we have a roll call? Yes. Mayor Turley. Gary Brevetto. Here. Bob Carlson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Harvey. Here. Ken Matthews. Here. Noel Sawyer. Here. John Schaefer. Here. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have the kinds of things that we really like to do at city council meetings, and that's some presentations and awards. And our, our first uh, acknowledgement uh, this evening is uh, for the Pikes Peak or Bust Rodeo, as well as our Girls of the West, and also the Range Riders. And what I'm going to do first is turn this over to the president of the Range Riders, um, Ron Brown. Ron, if you can come up to the uh, podium and give us your name and your address and, and tell us what's going with, on with the Pikes Peak Rodeo. The whole address or just town? Town's good. <laughs> okay. I'm Ron Brown. I'm from Colorado Springs. Good evening, Woodland Park City Council members. Um, my name is Ron Brown. I'm this year's president of the Pikes Peak Range Riders. This will be our 66th anniversary and I've been on 35 of these. Wow. I was a resident of Teller County uh, back in the late 1970s. I lived up off of Edlow Road for a few years. Loved it up here. Starting in 1949, the Range Riders have had a long relationship with the Woodland Park area and Teller County. Our first two range rides started at the Broadmoor Hotel, came up Cheyenne Canyon or Cheyenne Mountain around the backside of Pikes Peak, and terminated here in Woodland Park just down the road at Paradise Ranch, which is where the Safeway Shopping Center is now. Forty-four of our 66 rides have taken place in Teller County. This year, our fall family ride was held at Al Hagedorn's Broken Wagon Ranch off of Edlow Road. Previous to that, we've had several family rides. The Clark Ranch near Divide, Rainbow Valley Ranch south of Divide, and the Gillette Pancake Rocks area. The range ride was born in 1949. Uh, two friends came up with the idea. One, my grandfather, Ken Brookhart, and his friend, Everett Conover, as an idea to help promote the Pike Speaker Bust Rodeo. The ride is a five-day excursion, or as I like to call it, a great adventure. We have a Wrangler crew that watches over all our horses while they're on the picket line, but each rider is responsible for the care and feeding of their own horse. Our camp is set up by a camp crew. Our equipment is all transported by truck. We have a commissary crew that cooks delicious meals for us, and no one goes hungry. All this involves year-long planning of 23 separate committees to make this ride happen. At the end of each ride, we celebrate with a formal dinner uh, where we give out awards to members and buckles are given for our race and layover day events. Also at that time, we present the Silver Spur Award to an outstanding community leader. This year's ride will be held June 18th through the 22nd starting with the Colorado Springs Western Street Breakfast, downtown Colorado Springs. From there, the Range Riders ride over to Norris Penrose Stadium, where we will load into trailers and trucks. And this year, our ride will be down in Custer County at the Mountain Meadows Ranch, a ranch owned by the family of one of our members. Um, from there, we take daily rides out, and we have one day for our race and layover. We'll return on Sunday, June 22nd for our after-ride dinner and then back to our ordinary lives. Thank you for the opportunity for letting me present this. Are there any questions? No, Ron, but uh, thank you. Uh, I've, okay. I've been uh, either observing or participating in that, uh, um, the breakfast downtown every year for about 25 years, and I, I think That's it's great. a great event. I should mention, I forgot too, that all the proceeds from the street breakfast go to local military families. Hua. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Gary Markle, who is the president of the Pikes Peak or Bust Radio. Come on up, Gary.
My name is Gary Margol and I live in Colorado Springs and Cripple Creek. Uh, I'm not as formal as Ron, <clears throat> so I don't have a prepared text, but I will uh, take a few minutes and tell you about what we have going on this year. I suspect most of you um, know about the history of the Pikes Peak or Bus Rodeo, but we're in our 74th year. Obviously next year will be uh, 75 and we'll have a big celebration for that. Uh, the rodeo was started by Pen Spencer Penrose as a way to uh, bring his friends and uh, so forth back east to come out and uh, celebrate Western Heritage Days. And he expressly started the rodeo to support local military charities. So all the proceeds that the rodeo raises goes back to local military charities. And we've been doing that for since the beginning. And the last estimate was about over $3 million has been donated and to military charities since the inception. So we're real proud of that. This year's rodeo is going to be a great, uh, a great rodeo. We um, have just about all of our contestants signed up and contracted for, and many of the top cowboys and cowgirls uh, across the country are uh, decided to come and have contracted to, to be here. Uh, the dates are July 9th through the 12th. We have five performances starting on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday afternoon, and then the finals is on uh, Saturday night. What's different about this year is that uh, we will crown the winner of each event on Saturday night. In the past, uh, uh, contestants have come and um, competed, but nobody really knew who won in the bareback riding or the uh, bronc riding or whatnot. But this year, we'll have a uh, what we call a shoot-off where two people from each event will compete with each other. They'll pick a bull to ride out of, a, 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 out of three different bulls, and then they'll pick a, 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 a steers the rope, and uh, they'll go at it, and then we'll present the check to the, to the uh, winner. So it's going to be a great uh, rodeo this year. I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank Woodland Park, each one of you members of uh, City Council, for all your support for getting Woodland Park residents, Teller County residents, down to the rodeo each year. You've been a great supporter for many, many years, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, and now uh, Corliss Palmer, who's, who's been with the, the Girls of the West for some time, <laughs> is going to introduce those young ladies. Corliss, thanks. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm Corliss Palmer. I'm a longtime volunteer for the rodeo as a board member and director of the Girls of the West program. This is actually my 13th year. Um, I schedule and escort the girls to over 160 appearances within between mid-May mid and mid-July. The Girl of the West is a two-summer commitment. Oh, by the way, I'm from Falcon. I forgot that part. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it's a two-summer commitment. The aide is chosen um, one summer, and she is a competition that in, is comprised of horsemanship, speech, interview, and appearance. And then um, the girl, the aide from one year moves up to be the girl of the West the following summer. Um, you might have seen our pickup. Perkins Motors uh, uh, provides us a pickup, Ram pickup every year. And we've had it wrapped in pink with lots of graphics on it the last several years. So we're very um, noticeable around the community. Now I'll introduce the girls. Kate Watson is the girl of the West this year. She was here last year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's the 22-year-old daughter of Dwayne Watson and Deidre Smith. She's currently an audio production student at the Art Institute of Colorado with a goal of becoming a live show producer. As a third-generation Colorado native, Kate has always had a passion for horses, rodeo, and the Western way of life. She competed in local Gymkhana's National Barrel Horse Association races and Rocky Mountain Reining Horse Association shows. She was a member of 4-H for 10 years, showed um, goat, <coughs> sheep, and steers, and she was a member of the Pikes Peak Rangerettes for seven years. She served as queen of Black Forest Saddle Club in, 19, in 19, 2012, sorry, and she rides an American quarter horse named Tinkerbell. 
And the aid to girl of the West is Rachel Broughton. She's the 18 year old daughter of Brian and Julie Broughton. She's a Colorado native, recent graduate. Well, she graduates next week actually <laughs> from Lewis Palmer High School and where she's played lacrosse and they made playoffs, which was great. She will attend Western West Texas A&M University in the fall, majoring in psychology and criminal justice. She's been active in National Little Britches for six years, competing in all the events, but her passion is barrel racing. She will compete on the ro rodeo team at West Texas A&M. She was a member of the Pikes Peak Rangerettes for six years, and she rides an American quarter horse named Slugger. So please enjoy the Girls of the West presentation. And this is their first speech of the, of the year. Oh, good. <laughs> and we have some posters in the back. If you could put them up in, around the community, we would really appreciate it. Sure will. Coming up, ladies. Get ready as Cinch presents the Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo. July 9th through the 12th, 2014 are the dates, and the Norris Penrose Event Center in Colorado Springs is the place. The Norris Penrose Event Center is one of the finest places in the country to enjoy the sport of rodeo, and all of the top talent in the sport will be there to compete. I'm Kate Watson, Girl of the West. And I'm Rachel Broughton, aide to Girl of the West. The 74th Annual Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo runs Wednesday, July 9th through Saturday, July 12th, with performances at 7.15 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday evenings and a Saturday matinee at 12.45 p.m. The Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo will feature four performances of Invitational Championship Rodeo at its finest, with a Finals Championship Shootout on Saturday night. The Best in Each event will move on to compete in the Finals where the top prize money will be awarded. This rodeo is for the true fan, the first-timer, and everyone in between. The Harry Vold Rodeo Company provides premium bucking bulls and horses, and our announcer, Boyd Paul K Hamus, <laughs> keeps the crowd engaged, excited, and informed from the back of his horse in the arena. The stars of the 74th Annual Pike Speaker Bust Rodeo are the amazing athletes who come to compete in seven events, which include bareback riding, steer wrestling, team roping, saddle bronc riding, tie-down roping, barrel racing, and bull riding. There's more crowd-pleasing fun with Mutton Bustin', where a trophy is awarded to the winner at each performance. For complete pandemonium, be sure to catch the Wild Cow Milking, where the bravest teams compete for bragging rights. And that's not all. Our barrel man and specialty act, Mark Swingler, makes sure the rodeo fans enjoy every minute of every performance. With his outrageous antics, Mark creates an atmosphere of family fun for all ages. Plan to get your tickets early for the Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo because this is going to be a sellout. Plus, you save $3 on every ticket by purchasing your tickets in advance. Visit pikespeakerbus.org to get your tickets today. The Norris Penrose Event Center Ticket Office is open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo is a nonprofit event dedicated to preserving our Western heritage while supporting our local military and their families. This organization is led by an all-volunteer board of directors and several hundred other volunteers who help make this event happen each year. From the front of the house greeters, ushers, and security to the barns, chutes, and grounds, it takes thousands of man hours to put on this first class event. You'll see retired and active duty military, off-duty police and fire service professionals, local business owners and executives, ranchers and cowboys, and many others who fill in the ranks of volunteers at the Pike Speaker Bust Rodeo. Thanks to longtime support from Fort Carson, the 54th Annual Street Breakfast will get the Colorado Springs area geared up for the rodeo season. Join us downtown Wednesday, June 18th, anytime between 5.30 and 9 a.m. to be a part of this fun family tradition. Enjoy delicious pancakes and eggs cooked and served by our own Fort Carson soldiers. Tickets are only $5 and kids under 5 eat free. Then, send off the Pikes Peak Range Riders as they ride out of town to begin their 66th annual five-day ride to promote the Pikes Peaker Bus Rodeo. The 66th annual Kitty Dress-Up Review will be Saturday, July 5th at the Norris Penrose Event Center. Registration will begin at 9 a.m. with the contest at 10. There is no charge and children ages 3 through 12 will be competing in five categories. Working Cowboy, Working Cowgirl, Novelty Girl, Novelty Boy, and Rodeo Arena. All contestants will receive prizes with awards going to the top three in each event. Winners can also ride in the rodeo parade. 
The 74th Annual Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo Parade, a Colorado Springs favorite, is Tuesday evening, July 8th at 6.30 p.m. in downtown Colorado Springs. This event takes place on Tejon Street starting at St. Vrain and heading south to Vermaho. Free to watch and fun for the whole family, this beloved Western cultural event kicks off the annual Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo in grand fashion. Money raised by parade entries will go directly toward assisting our local militaries and their families. Then it's time to rodeo. Mark your calendar, buy your tickets, and get ready as Cinch presents championship rodeo action at its best. The dates again for the Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo are ju Wednesday, July 9th through Saturday, July 12th. There's lots to do before the rodeo begins. Grounds open at 4 p.m. for all evening performances and 10 a.m. for the Saturday matinee. Come early, skip the traffic, and enjoy the family-friendly pre-show fun, including mutton busting tryouts, gold panning, pony rides, mechanical bull rides, and much, much more. Then, make sure to be in your seats by 7 p.m. to enjoy the Pikes Peak Rangerettes and the Pikes Peak Range Rider Pivots horseback drill teams. After the rodeo, head on over to the Coors Roadhouse Saloon for great live music, dancing, and some ice-cold Coors. Our local military are honored at each performance. Fort Carson on Wednesday evening, Missile Defense and 300 Second Airlift Wing on Thursday evening, Air Force Base Command on Friday evening, Air Force Academy at the Saturday matinee, and NORAD U.S. Northcom on Saturday evening. Advanced adult tickets start at $23 and parking is free. Grandstand seating tickets for children 12 and under are half price for all evening performances and only $1 for the Saturday matinee. Military and group discounts are available. Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo is supported by generous sponsorships from many national and local sponsors. We encourage you to support these sponsors shown on our banner of company logos as well as the rodeo's website. Remember to purchase your tickets online or at the Norris Penrose Event Center box office. You can find all this information and much more about the Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo at our website, pikespeakerbus.org. We look forward to seeing you at the 74th Annual Pike Speaker Bus Rodeo, July 9th through the 12th at the Norris Penrose Event Center in Colorado Springs. Very good. <laughs> ladies, if, ladies, if you could come back up with uh, Ron and Gary and Corliss. Um, I have the coveted Woodland Park uh, pin, and I think a couple of you may have some already. Uh, so now you can make your rings out of them. <laughs> I really appreciate the promotion of, of something that's very unique to our culture and our way of life up here. So, um, in addition to being really good at athletes, I can't believe you memorized that whole thing. So, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did a complete pandemonium one? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, again, thanks, guys. All right, Lisa, I think the next one you're going to take for us, and that's the presentation of the Bear Aware Drawing Contest uh, by Columbine Elementary School. Thank you, yes. And good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. And I'm actually going to ask uh, if Renee Bunting is here, I, I want her to come join because she's our Keep Within Park beautiful chair of our committee and of course without the committee we couldn't do any of this stuff. So um, this is our uh, Bear Awareness annual uh, drawing contest that we do every year. Um, this is actually the second time that we've done this, and I don't know, many of you probably weren't here uh, last year or may not recall, but we had a young gal from the high school here in Witham Park come to us last year and talk to council and keep Witham Park beautiful about the bears and how the bears were getting into the trash and um, being attracted by things that we were doing in our community uh, to our community and uh, putting the bears in danger as well as us and our community. And so one of the things that came out of that was that we should place more emphasis on bear awareness. So many actions have been taken and um, Keep Within Park Beautiful has been tasked and takes on greatly uh, this message to the community uh, regarding bear awareness. So this is just one way that we are able to do that. 
And of course, what better than to do that with our young, um, our young children? So this year, we approached Columbine Elementary and Principal Vulcan, as well as uh, art teacher Emily Heckman, were a tremendous help in this effort this year. Um, I don't see them here. Oh, there they are. There, there she is. Thank you. So thank you so much for what you've done for us and allowing us to come into Columbine and do this contest and also provide bear awareness. We really appreciate that. And um, so we have some awards. I'm just going to go over some details on that contest. Uh, so our art, the art teacher for Columbine, Ms. Heckman, took on a lot of this responsibility. And what she did was she gave um, the children in grades one through four our tips, our bear awareness tips, tips like don't leave your trash out at night, uh, don't put bird seed in your bird seed uh, feeders during the summer. Even though you want to, it attracts the bears. Don't believe it or not, have a scented candle in your window and open up your window, it'll attract bears. And so they were given all these tips by her through us and then asked to present us a drawing, if they would, that, that basically demonstrated these tips. And we got over 150 drawing submissions from grades one through four at Columbine Elementary. And it was just, all of them were just wonderful drawings and demonstrations. But we um, part it down to a good 50, just based on the tips and the demonstration of those tips. And then the group literally voted. And we put numbers on each drawing, and then they voted on the number that they felt best demonstrated. So they didn't have names or anything like that. Um, and all of those children were given uh, a forum at a school forum. We work very closely with Tanya Sharp. She's the district wildlife manager. And she has her own bear awareness uh, volunteer group. Jason Pierce is one of those volunteers. And so on the 30th of April, we actually were able through the principal to visit the school and do a presentation. Uh, to all the students. So on top of the drawings this year, we were able to talk to them about the bears and give them a presentation. And then we gave them a coloring book that was provided that also demonstrates those tips and asked them to share that with their family and friends so that they could further spread that awareness and they could become the experts in their families. And um, the presentation that we gave basically explained the biology, the habitat, and the behavior, how to reduce negative uh, encounters with bears, and how to live with them safely. A couple of things before I announce and ask Mayor Pro Tem to come down and help us with the awards uh, that I just want to let you know about with regards to bear awareness is that um, the drawing contest actually doesn't end here because we actually take it a step further and we've worked with the Rampart Range Library and their lower level gallery is going to have all of those drawings displayed from the 27th of May to June 6th. And it's an excellent opportunity for not only the children to see their work that they worked so hard at, uh, up in the library, but also to see who the winners were. And then we also have a table out that provides oodles of information on how to live with the bears and how, how to behave around bears and not, not attract them. Then on June 7th, we are going to have our annual Keep Woodland Park Beautiful Cleanup, and we're so excited for the cleanup this year because we just have um, metamorphosed this into a little bit more where we have tables of people that come and provide information. And one of those tables is going to be Tanya Sharp and her bear volunteers, and they'll have a bear hide, and they'll have all sorts of bear tips as well. And then in June on the 17th, right here in the City Hall Chambers, we're going to have Tanya Sharp come with her bear awareness group. And it's open to the public. It's open to the whole community to come and learn about how to interpret bear behaviors and how to live around them. And then also, just so you know, we're also looking into, an, alongside with the code um, enforcement official and um, Bob Larson and the Woodland Park Police Department, uh, as well as Tanya, just looking at our codes for garbage and refuse to better determine if we're, in fact, putting enough in there for regulation and enforcement. Um, because bears and trash really go hand in hand. So uh, we're going to be looking at that a little bit further. 
And so, without further ado, I'm going to ask Mayor Pro Tem to come down and join us. And then, Renee, if you wouldn't mind grabbing the stack of awards and giving those to the Mayor Pro Tem as she comes down. And I'm going to call your names. This is the drawing for our first grade winner, Avery Walker. Avery, could you come up and meet Mayor Pro Tem Harvey and, and Renee? And she did a wonderful drawing of a bear. And obviously, you can tell that the trash is full. So it's during the day, and the trash is full. And guess what attracted the bear? So wonderful job, Avery. And then we have our second grade winner, and that's Isaiah Wiley. And what I love about this drawing is his little caricature uh, He's got a, I guess, a balloon, you would call it, coming out of his head, because you know he's contemplating getting into the trash, but yet it's crossed out, so you know you're not supposed to go there. So it's really great. Good job. And then we also have our third grade winner, and that's Lindsay McLaughlin. And Lindsay did a very fine drawing also of a bear. And what I think I like most about this, again, it's the trash is out and it's daytime. But you can see the little sad face in the bear's stomach in, in the little red, red. It looks like a steak. I'm not really sure, but it's really great. So. And then our last award goes to Tyler Time, our fourth grade winner. And I'm not sure that Tyler was able to make it. Maybe, um, would you, Principal Vulcan, would you be willing to bring this up? And, and Tyler did a wonderful job as well where he uh, displays again. It's daytime and there's trash. And the bear is actually inside the trash on this one. So we just, we really appreciate all the effort that they've done uh, to learn the tips and the, the willingness of the principal and her staff to allow us to come and talk to the children. So good job. in the library. That'll be great. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, Kelly, you're up next. We have the presentation of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the year ending December 31st, 2013. And uh, Kelly Case, our finance director, will make this presentation along with uh, our auditor, uh, Wendy Swanhorst. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, Council. It's my pleasure to introduce you again this year, and for some of you the first time, our auditor, Wendy Swanhorst. She's been working with the city, and, and for you, actually, uh, doing the city's audit annually and uh, reviewing and, and helping staff put together the financial statements each year. So without further ado, I'll introduce Wendy. Good evening. <coughs> Wendy Swanhorst with Swanhorst and Company. Uh, those last two agenda items are a little hard to follow, but um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and make this quick and not too boring. Um, we audited your financial statements for the year and 12, year ended 12 31 2013. You probably got in PDF format these financial statements. And then we give you what we call a management letter, which is our communication to you guys as the governing board. So I'm going to stick to what this management letter says, and then if you guys have any questions on these, we'll try to answer those too. But this letter starts out by telling you what it is an auditor does. And essentially, we're hired by you to tell you that the numbers in these financial statements that come from your accounting records are fairly stated in all material respects. And so within this document, you'll see our audit opinion. It's a clean, unmodified opinion 
the best opinion you can get. Um, one of the other things we do, we did this year, but we don't do every year, but any time you receive over half a million dollars in federal dollars, we do some additional audit testing. Um, th that's all required by the federal government, just to make sure you comply with all the rules and regulations. And then our last responsibility under the auditing standards is if we identify any material weaknesses in your internal controls that could allow for errors in the financial statements, fraud, or anything like that. That's what we're required to tell you about in this letter. Um, in summary, I would say your accounting records are in very good condition. The only thing that's really mentioned in this, in this management letter is that because you're a small organization, um, you don't have internal controls or segregation of duties over everything meaning sometimes you've got people that can do every step of a process, you know. Um, you've got pretty good internal controls in place, but there are just some things because you're so small. You, you know, you're never going to have two people involved in everything. So that, that it sometimes can allow for those human errors and things like that. But we just don't see things like that. We don't make significant adjustments to your accounting records or anything. So I'd say the audit went really well. And that... That is all I have to tell you, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Wendy, or Mayor Pro Tem, before we get started with the questions, let me just remind the council that this is an auditing document based on generally accepted accounting principles, not to be confused with our budget document. There's very few places where the numbers actually correspond, and sometimes over the years that's caused frustration for councils, uh, but we can certainly correlate the numbers as best we can for some very specific areas. But just understand that they're two very different documents for two very different purposes. Thank you. Okay, questions from Council for Wendy? Go ahead. I Actually, uh, yeah, I came, came to learn that last year when I had a lot of questions, most of which were irrelevant. <laughs> but I, I did... Uh, um, Want ask your uh, uh, Kelly uh, uh, to to provide us on page 28 where we list the revenues and expenditures. Normally, if the first time we see the audit numbers are when you come out with with the fo following year budget, like this October, we'll see the audited exp revenues expenditures uh, <coughs> broken down by the normal categories. Like for instance, on page 28, you have taxes. But there's all kinds of taxes. There's a, uh, in, uh, property taxes, the sales taxes, a number of others. So I've asked Kelly to provide that breakdown kind of in advance of what we'll see in October because that's relevant information right now. So appreciate that. Yes, sir. So that was a statement, not a question. No, that, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, that's a statement. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it was a request. It was a request. A request. <coughs> and it's duly noted. Thank you. No. Kelly? Yes, Wendy? Thanks. Great. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Right. Um, moving on to item five additions, deletions, or corrections to the agenda. There are none this evening. Right. We'll move on then to the consent <laughs> calendar. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Cindy. It looks like Bill may have a couple of comments as well. He may. We have uh, four items tonight. Approval of your last meeting's minutes. That was May 1st. Approval of the eight, April 2014 Statement of Expenditures. And then consideration and approval for two contracts, uh, the City and Rocky Mountain Materials for the construction of the City Hall Park and Ride lot right behind City Hall building. And the second between Woodland Park, City of Woodland Park and Schmidt construction for the resurfacing uh, of portion of the Centennial <coughs> Trail. What questions may we answer? Questions? Yes. Go ahead. Centennial Trail. What's the time frame for that? Well, it'll be paved this, this um, summer. We don't have a specific schedule from the contractor yet because we don't have a contract yet. So once we have a contract, uh, but typically it's in the July-August time frame that we'll be resurfacing this portion of the Centennial Trail. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll um, 
Entertain a motion then to accept the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Take a vote, please. Thank you. Brevetto? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thanks. Unfinished business. It appears we have none. We'll move on now to um, item 8, Alpha. Consider ordinance number 1216, amending chapter 18.09 of the Woodland Park Municipal Code to allow for up to two dwelling units within the same structure as a permitted use within all commercial zone districts and set the public hearing for June 5th, 2014. This is a legislative action. This is an initial posting. There is no public comment uh, anticipated for this, so I'll now turn it over to Ms. Riley. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Council members, good evening. Uh, this is the initial posting for Ordinance 1216. This idea of allowing for up to two residential units within a commercial zone uh, was generated out of the community assessment for Main <coughs> Street and the mayor uh, picked up on a comment that was made during the focus groups and uh, met with myself and the city manager and said let's take a look at this and try to get this done so as a result we have put together a fairly simple ordinance that amends a portion n of our uh, use matrix and the planning commission heard this last week uh, they recommend approval of the um, ordinance and at the next meeting I will be happy to give you a thorough review of the content unless you have some questions this evening. This is the initial posting but does council have any questions for staff? No. <coughs> if not, I'll entertain a motion to consider ordinance number 1216 on its first posting for a public hearing to be scheduled on the 10th <coughs> of June. So approved. Second. I'll second it. Okay. Thanks. Vote, please. Thank you. Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Rivetto? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we'll see Sally again in the near future. All right, now to item nine, public hearings, uh, where public comment can be heard. Uh, we have one item, I believe, uh, and if I can enter into the record this statement um, about um, electronic media or electronic systems. Council members use electronic devices to access the materials relevant to the public hearing before us. Uh, be assured that this is to a co is the common practice of the city council that these devices are not being used for texting, emailing, or other communications during the public hearings. Okay, Lisa, over to you. Thank you. This is a request for a vacation of right of way for Aspen Street. This is the portion of Aspen Street that lies between the alley which is in between Lake Avenue and South Avenue as well as South Avenue and uh, you can see in this picture here that's about midway in, in between here to here. Um, our applicants for this request are Peter Popescu. He is the property owner of the house over here off to the uh, e the west of the Aspen Street right-of-way. He's property owner of 308 Aspen Street uh, and also the second applicant is the other abutting owner to this uh, street right-of-way and that owner is uh, Mr. Steve Kopp and he is the property owner of this vacant lot which is lot four. And these two property owners are looking to vacate this um, Aspen Street right-of-way. The owner of the 308 um, Aspen Street is claiming that he uses this as his sole access and also as part of his parking of his vehicles. Um, and you can tell from the terrain that's been trampled down from this visual, this uh, aerial, that the predominant amount of um, vegetation that's been trampled down is directly 
to um, the front of his house, which the front of his house faces Aspen Street. And then this is the vacant lot for Steve Kopp, and his intentions are that he had, this is vacant uh, property lot that he owns and is looking to clean up Aspen Street for potential sale of that property in the future or perhaps development. He's not really sure exactly which, but he knows that it needs to be cleaned up either way. Um, the other thing that I want to point out from this aerial map is that the northern portion, and you'll see this in my next example a little bit better, of Aspen Street going up to Lake Avenue, which is up here, has already been vacated. And this was vacated in May of 1994 in an easement plat that shows that vacation, as well as this portion of the alley that divides um, this area. And as you can tell, it's unimproved. Uh, it's not real obvious that there's an alley there even anymore. This here is, I'll also depict this on a site plan for you um, in a couple slides, but I wanted to, to you to take note of the fact that this is the private property access um, through lots 10 and 11, which are directly next to Peter uh, Papescu's uh, property, and this has been designated as a private access easement uh, in 1994 as part of that as part of that plat. It's just good to point that out at the visual here, and this is a little bit closer look of that in a plan view. And one of the things that I want to point out to you again is the cross hatch here, or the the straight lines, diagonal lines, are indicating the vacation in accordance with that recorded plat on, on May 24th, 1994, where the portion of the northern Aspen Street from Lake Avenue down to that alley was previously vacated, as well as the portion that roughly starts between one lots one and two uh, to the north on Block 9 over of that alley. So that is a closer demonstration of that. This is the request uh, exhibit that comes along with that vacation of right of way that they have provided as an example. And as is the guidance for section 12 that talks to vacation of right of way when there is a uh, straight line of right of way that's bounded, it is uh, normal standard uh, in that regulation that the abutting property owners would split that, divide that. So that is what is being depicted here. Aspen Street right of way is 60 feet in width, so it would be 30 feet to either property owner that uh, abuts that right of way. Here are some photos of the existing conditions of Aspen Street right of way. This uh, first shot up here is from the alley looking down to South Avenue. This is Peter uh, Popescu's home. And as you can see, it faces here. And even in this photograph, uh, a car in the, the supposed drive right-of-way that is, has become his right-of-way that he's claiming is his sole access. And this photo down uh, to the bottom is from <coughs> Lake Avenue, looking down across the entire Aspen, what was uh, Aspen Street right of way to the north, and then what now is in consideration for vacation of right of way down to South Street, or South Avenue, excuse me. And this is looking up the other direction from South Avenue up to Lake Avenue, as well as from the <coughs> alley down to Lake Avenue. Again, the reasons we're here are to hear about the vacation request of right-of-way uh, between lots 12 of Block 9, and that is the lot for Peter Popescu, and lot 4 of Block 16 being Mr. Kopp's um, uh, vacant lot. And uh, the criteria that staff uses to analyze these requests falls in our Section 12. Point zero eight vacation of public right of way. It does entail six criteria that we are asked to analyze the request to, and I'm going to go over each of those and then just explain our viewpoint from from those criteria. 
the first criteria is that the uh, existing utilities, we need to evaluate the existing utilities <coughs> located in that right of way. And for this, because we already had a vacation of the northern portion, we wanted to remain consistent to that. So we, we looked at first the northern portion that had been previously vacated and then uh, how it should be consistently applied with regard to easements, any potential utilities through the um, southern portion that, that's in question for vacating. And there are no current service providers in that northern portion um, easement. There is, in fact, a 30-foot easement, 15-foot on either side of that center line to the uh, owners of the properties on either side of that. And that easement is actually a 30-foot public utility easement as well as a pedestrian easement um, that was reserved <coughs> for the future. However, going back to that aerial view, you'll notice that it doesn't seem like it's really uh, created a social trail through there for, to justify a pedestrian easement. Um, so when we looked at this portion below for any potential easements that would need to be carried through, we really felt that the pedestrian easement wasn't necessary. Uh, we also have all of our internal departments as well as <coughs> utility providers um, in the area look at these requests and our utilities director Kip Wiley did review this and uh, believes that it would be important for us to have a continue that utility easement to the south. Um, also in addition to that IREA did come back with a comment that there are existing uh, electric facilities up on the parallel northern edge of <coughs> the street to South <coughs> Avenue and would like to reserve 10 foot public utility easement along that southernmost parallel portion to Aspen Street uh, in order to service that. So that looks like this when you put it together uh, on the plan, this being the 30 foot. Uh, public utility easement as well as the 10-foot reserve public uh, utility easement for IREA facilities. And these have been um, shared with the applicants. The applicants are fine with those easements, agree to those easements. And so those will be a condition of this uh, particular recording to add those before recording. Criteria number two talks about emergency services access, and we do not feel that this will deny emergency service providers access uh, for this small uh, 8,400 square, square foot um, right-of-way that's being uh, vacated. There are emergency accesses through five various rights-of-way surrounding this. First to the south, we have South Avenue, which most of the residences off of this street have their ingress egress off of that South Avenue. And then lots to the east, we have Boundary Street as access. Lots to the northwest have a uh, private easement access. And this is a close up of that private access easement. And there is also a, an agreement that was put into place. And I believe I attached that to your packets as well uh, for you to review. Um, and this is. When they created this uh, easement plat back in 1994, they utilized lines, which was a little more elementary and not so obvious. Sometimes they blurred together, but if you close up and look at it, uh, I believe I included the full map for you, you can tell that it talks about this 20-foot public utility easement and private access easement, and that's right here over lots 10 and um, 10 and 11. We also have uh, to the north Lake Avenue, which does provide access to a few of those residences. And then also we have the uh, eastern portion of that alley remaining. It is unimproved, but nevertheless a, an access. Criteria number three talks about the feasibility of road construction. And again, all of the agencies reviewed this, fire department uh, reviewed this, as well as um, the utility providers and emergency services. Those all reviewed this to make sure that it was not going to impede um, that sort of thing. And the road construction as well, um, we had our city engineer look at this. and. There are no plans to improve 
the alley or Aspen Street right-of-way. Um, road construction to the remaining and surrounding rights-of-ways will not be impaired due to this. And again, a very small portion and also adjacent to an already vacated portion of Aspen Street. Criteria number four talks about access to the lots that are abutting the vacation area. And this is kind of covered under emergency services, but more focused at the property owners that surround this area. Um, I've labeled them. Number one here, of course, is Mr. Steve Copps. And he has already, um, excuse me, Mr. Steve Kopp. And he has already um, determined that he will provide access to his vacant lot when it's developed through uh, South Avenue. And then we have Miss Ferguson, who has the uh, private access agreement for her lot here at number two. And then off of Boundary Street, this is um, commercial property. It is um, for Mr. Randy Coburn, and he's recently been doing some improvements. His access and also his parking is off of Boundary Road. And then, of course, again, we have that unimproved alley access that's on the eastern portion through the middle. Criteria number five talks about area traffic patterns. And the area traffic does operate sufficiently. Um, mm -hmm. Again, city engineer and police chief reviewed the request. No traffic issues were noted. And vacating that small portion mm -hmm. of Aspen Street, not going to be an issue, especially since it leads into another vacated portion of the Aspen Street to the north. Criteria number six talks about adjacent landowners input. We did follow appropriate public notification procedures and then in addition to that we also provided adjacent property letters to residents within 150 feet radius and we did receive two responses from property owners in that area that were just inquiring into the nature of the request and desired some further details. And then also since the, the planning commission, we did receive a contact from Ms. Carol Wingo, who is the lots that are to the west of Mr. Peter Popescu's 308 Aspen Street um, and the, the one of the applicants to this uh, particular request. And Carol has expressed her opinions that she would like to see the section, this section of Aspen Street remain open to better serve as access to houses and the alley. Um, and, and so I did include a copy of a formal letter, requested her to write us a formal letter. She's not local. That is included as part of your packet as well. <coughs> It's staff's recommendation along with the approval and recommendation of planning commission to you that we approve uh, this vacation of right of way. And we have two conditions that we would like to place on this ordinance. And that is consistent to the public utility pedestrian easement shown in the easement dedication plat of 1994, 15 foot mm -hmm. should be designated to either side of the center line equating to 30 foot public utility easement shall be added to the exhibit prior to final recording. And number two, also that there be a 10 foot public utility easement parallel to the northern boundary of the South Avenue rights of way, uh, which is added to, to the exhibit again prior to final recording. And that's all that I have. Do you have any questions for me? Questions from uh Council for Lisa for staff. Well, when that was first approved way back when to be a right of way, uh, what justification was there to make that a right of way back then? When it when it was approved yeah, to be vacated at that point, that it is a right of way access for the public. Their their justification at that time. I'm, I'm not real familiar with that. Maybe Sally, would you have an answer for that since you were here at that time? <laughs> this is the Greens edition, and this subdivision was platted in 1888. So Sally was not here. Was not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's for the vacation. Right? Asking about the oh. Sally was starting to shake. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Sally. Um, 
So okay. in, in the 1800s, late 1800s, when they platted much of the older part of town, they used a grid system approach, which had the 60-foot rights of way, small lots that were typically platted by 50 to 150 deep with alleys in the back. <coughs> They were probably being uh, drafted in Kansas City, somewhere where they had no concern about topography or other constraints. So what they were thinking over 100 years ago, who knows? Well, I think that was it exactly. It was a grid system. If you look at the plats of the central part of downtown, it's all very rectangular and very square. There are numerous places in town where rights of way have not been built on simply because of the terrain. Uh, so this is not an unusual circumstance at all for it not to have been built on. <coughs> Other questions for uh, Lisa or Sally? I have one. I'm, I'm not certain what difference it makes to, to do the vacation of right away if we then add back those two uh, easements that you talked about. What is What is exactly does that mean? Well, those easements are designated for the utilities, okay. but they can still they will still gain the 15 foot um, that that goes on either side of that middle easement, and so it opens up the ability for him to use. Uh, when I say him, I'm talking about Peter Popescu and his residents to use that uh, as parking and their access and then also because of the fact that they're using it and the city has said that we're not improving it then he would have the ability to approve that or you Improve. know approve any do any improvements that he needed okay so title passes to the private owners okay S subject to the reservation of the easement okay thanks uh, if there's no other questions from the council for the staff um, we'll now open it for public comment is there anyone who'd like to come and speak to, for, against, about? Seeing none, we'll now close uh, public comment. Um, and let's see if the Planning Commission has any final questions before I entertain a motion. Planning Commission? Or City Council, sorry. <laughs> none? None. Okay. Well, so was that a motion? Move to approve ordinance. 1215 with the two conditions uh, briefed by uh, Lisa. Second. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> Let's go for a vote. Thank you. Harvey? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Rivetto? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we have a pretty uh, brief uh, agenda tonight, so we're now going to go. Uh, to public comments that are not on, or public comment on items not on the agenda, we have two folks that have signed up. Uh, Steve Jurislow, who wants to mm -hmm. comment on agenda item 8 alpha. Uh, and I, I remind everyone that 8 alpha was uh, an initial posting, but uh, Steve, if you would like to make comments, come on up. And state your name and your address, please. Steve Jerislow, I live at 610 Sun Valley Drive here in Woodland Park. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on 8A, particularly since you noted earlier that it wasn't open for, <laughs> for public comment. I don't think I realized that at the time I signed up. My comments will be very, very brief. Um, my concern is with the, not the current application of the draft ordinance, uh, number 1216, but the future application. Uh, the current application, as envisioned, applies to the commercial core of Woodland Park. And in that regard, from my particular perspective, I, th I think it's probably a smart idea, probably a good idea, and I'll let people more uh, articulate than I am discuss that application. But with regard to uh, potential future application of all of the five uh, commercially zoned uh, districts that we have in town, I do urge the council to seriously consider what impacts that may that may have on adjacent uh, homeowners. And in the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell you that I'm one of the NIMBY guys, not in my backyard. Well, for the first time since I've been living here, there's now a matter before the council that potentially, potentially, a couple of years from now that might affect not my backyard but actually my front yard 
because a corner of my property shares a corner with uh, a, a certain area, uh, 13 acres uh, across the highway, diagonally across the highway from Woodland Park, from, excuse me, from uh, Walmart, and that is owned commercial slash uh, multi-residential. And it seems to me that this proposed ordinance could affect that property as well, which means it could affect me somewhere down the road if and when that property is subsequently sold and, and developed. So, uh, and I'm sure there are many other uh, private homeowners throughout the community whose property abuts one of these commercially zoned areas, particularly neighborhood commercial. So in the course of the deliberations over the next several meetings, I urge the council to, with the help of, of Sally Riley, and her staff to carefully consider the impact that it might have on those other zones, particularly those near private neighborhoods. Thanks, David, and I hope to see you again then at the, the 5th of June uh, public hearing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Darlene Hunera. I don't have anything, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Darlene. Okay, uh, anyone else who did not sign up that would like to uh, make any uh, comments on an item not on the agenda? Uh, reports. Uh, I have, I think, a list of things that I will not be able to read quite as eloquently as Mayor Turley, but um, let's uh, get these out there for the public. On Friday, May 16th, it's the third Friday Art Walk in downtown Midland <coughs> Park, and that is from 5 to 8, and I'm almost certain we're going to have good weather, so please do <laughs> attend. On Tuesday, May 20th, the Chamber's Business After Hours at Above the Tree Line at Above Tree Line Construction on Highway 24 in Divide. That's 5:30 to 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 21st of May, is Ride of Silence. That's a slow-paced five-mile bicycle ride honoring injured or killed cyclists, and they will uh, meet at Woodland Park High School uh, at, from 7 to 8:30 p.m. Um, and that is a free event. Any comments on that? Any? Of that. Okay. Uh, Wednesday, May 28th, there is a ceremony at Lions Park honoring the 4th Engineer Battalion at 4.30 p.m. And David, do you have details? I'd like to share a few with council in the audience. Uh, most folks know that the City of Woodland Park entered into a partnership with the 4th Engineer Battalion out of Fort Carson <coughs> in 1992, uh, thanks to the efforts of many, some sitting at this dais. Uh, and in two, in a 19... 92, uh, an additional flagpole was installed in Lyons Park to fly the engineer flag, and that partnership has been going on ever since. Since the global war on terrorism started, uh, we've paid special attention to the 4th Engineer Battalion and when they've been gone, and we decided uh, in cooperation with the battalion commander that we would only fly the flag when soldiers from that battalion were in harm's way. And over the last three years, continuously, elements of the 4th Engineer Battalion have either been in Iraq or Af Afghanistan, and the flag has flown nonstop to remind the community that we have soldiers that we're connected with who are in harm's way protecting our freedoms. The last soldiers from the, that unit will come home this weekend. This weekend. And so on Wednesday, May 28th, the senior leadership from the battalion and the community will gather at Lyons Memorial Park at 4.30 in the afternoon to lower the engineer flag, recognizing that all those soldiers are back home with their families uh, having done their duty. So I wanted to invite the council, I want to invite the community to Lions Memorial Park on Wednesday, May 28th at 4.30 for what will be a, a very wonderful ceremony. Thank you. Thanks, David. I will be there. Um, on the 1st of June, which is a Sunday, there will be Jazz in June at the Ute Pass Cultural Center at 2 p.m., and that is free. And then finally, on Thursday, the 5th of June, the Chambers Lunch and Learn on the USA Pro Challenge Cycling event um, begins at 1130 and goes to 1. Reservations are required, and you can call, I'm assuming you can call the Chamber for that. Uh, any more information on that? Um, anyone here that has any more comments on that one? Okay, thanks. Um, let's go ahead and go to Council Reports. Um, I, I want to make a comment. Um, uh, Councilman Carlson is going to talk a little bit about uh, most recent activities of the uh, Woodland Aquatic Project Board, uh, but I've also asked uh, our city manager to talk about um, a concept that we discussed uh, collectively uh, on, on a way ahead for the potential financing 
um, approach for uh, an aquatic project here in town. But uh, so we'll have a little bit of both uh, from both of those gentlemen. Um, Gary, anything? I'll start with Gary. Gary's excited, I can tell. Hmm. Main Street's been meeting, uh, Brian's not here tonight, so uh, Main Street's been meeting every week, and we're going to meet every two weeks uh, uh, starting the next meeting, actually, after that will be meeting two weeks. Uh, but the board is, is plugging along with everything that they've got to do to submit the uh, package uh, on July 1st for us to uh, at least be a contender for Main Street designation. So that's going along very well. Uh, Creative Arts District is... Uh, having a retreat on May 27th for the board of directors, <coughs> the new board of directors, and from that they're going to decide how to, you know, organize themselves so that they can be an effective creative arts district over here. So it looks pretty promising. Other than that, I've got one concern. We're we're approaching fire season, and uh, I've gone to briefings before, uh, the assessments and all that stuff about. You know, what do we do to mitigate, obviously, uh, in our environment here to uh, make it safer for us? But I was looking at this, and, you know, I was in the military for 23 years, space operations. I'm aware of sensors that we have and of what the technology that we have to be able, one, to detect these fires in the first place. And I'm not too sure, I, I don't know what I'm asking for, but I'm asking maybe for a consensus on this board to see we, as a unit, make our concern known to organizations like Pikes Peak Area Council, which is an organization which includes many counties together, and by, by <clears throat> coalescing our activities together, we can, we can be more formative as far as making requests to government agencies to do things for us like fire mitigation. Uh, I'd like to have maybe some sort of consensus from this group here. If we should proactively go out there and suggest that uh, we have some sort of detection method. One of the ideas I had before, which was turned down by actually the um, National Park Service, I forget, Jerry, I think her name was, I mentioned it to her, so oh, we can't do that. Well, you know, I think as far as fire is concerned, I think detection is a major factor. You know, we can detect these fires before they get out of hand. I mean, we can get ahead of the game. I'm trying to be proactive here. But in order to do that, you've got to involve a lot of governmental agencies. One of the ideas I had was, you know, we got rid of a lot of the fire towers in the past because of budgetary constraints. And fire towers have been our big source of being able to detect fires around the country. Uh, we have a wonderful mountain here called you know, Pikes Peak. On top of Pikes Peak affords us a 360 degree panorama view of an entire huge area. And I, you know, I'd like to maybe somehow go forward to governmental agencies to put detection system on top of Pikes Peak during the areas, during the times where our fire hazard are highest. And that's one idea I have, is first detect. It's great detecting, and, and that's one of the efforts, but after detection, we have to have a way of responding to that so that it doesn't get out of hand. If you can catch this fire with an hour or two after it, in all likelihood, you can probably prevent it from spreading out. And that would involve a lot of governmental interagency actions and MOUs, and memorandum understands and memorandum agreements, with, for instance, the C-130 outfit for ret fire retarding stuff, with the uh, Army for the helicopters and other civilian contractors that can pour water on these things. The whole idea is you detect, then you have people on alert during this period of time who can go out there and respond real quickly to prevent us from getting Gatashi like we've had in the past. So that's what I'm looking for is have a consensus over here. Uh, you think it's smart for us to maybe voice our opinion to like Pikes Peak Area Council to go further with governmental organizations to be able to present this kind of approach to them. Which, you know, I don't know if they've thought about it, but you know, well, it's one well, of the things I'm, I'm looking at. I'm pretty certain they've thought about it and um, uh, I'm going to ask David to respond to part of that because I, I totally agree with you in terms of detection. Uh, that that might be one of our weak links, but in terms of intergovernmental agreements, uh, there are quite a few in place. I, I mean, it's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but uh, David, if you want to talk about some of those agreements that we have with neighboring uh, entities and uh, federal partners, absolutely. 
and these aren't just as a result of the Waldo Canyon fire, <clears throat> excuse me, or the Black Forest fire. These have been in place for decades. <coughs> but there are partnerships. I, I, I understand completely what you're saying. Detect, respond, eliminate the, the issue. Uh, the forests around us belong to the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, so that would be our first uh, opportunity, and I don't want to use the word hurdle, but it would be our first opportunity to cause something to occur. We periodically meet with them as, as intergovernmental agencies. Uh, the last meeting was probably mm, in the spring of last year, perhaps the fall, and it was down in Colorado Springs. About 100 people showed up. Uh, all fire districts, all municipalities, U.S. Forest Service, State Forest Service, etc. The detection process that you're mentioning, perhaps it would work, and, per, and we can certainly ask them to, to pursue that. But I'll tell you that there are, there are numerous detection opportunities that exist right now from satellites, but the confusion that exists is many people burn things in the, in the rural areas. They're not, they're not mandated to not burn things like we are here in the city limits. So sometimes there are multiple fires going that are controlled burns, et cetera. So there has to be this communication effort to identify what's, what's a hazard and what's not. Um, <coughs> But the, we do lean forward. In fact, I still owe the council an update on our own after action review from the Waldo Canyon fire, and I've not forgot about that. Um, Bill, you've, we've got lots of fire expertise sitting at this table. Uh, Bill fought fires in Idaho. Do you have any thoughts? You've worked with well, the Forest Service. Yeah, I would just like to offer that over the last several years through the Healthy Forest Initiative and all, we have been the recipient and the beneficiary of a lot of uh, forest fuels mitigation work around the city of Woodland Park to protect our city. Um, I don't think there's any other entity around the state that's probably been benefited as much as we have. Those efforts are continuing. Uh, we've been a little frustrated this year to get from the Forest Service where, where exactly they're working this year and what they're doing, um, but uh, we're in contact with them uh, on the local level, the, the local works that are up here. Um, I contact with them almost weekly on the recreational things, but also on fire and fuels and, and public works, and I, I won't speak for the chief, but we're in contact with the fire district, and we're all working hand in hand every day on those kinds of issues. Um, we also have a, our, our community has a heightened sense of awareness too, and the chief gets calls or his 911 gets many calls, but if the council wants to, to draft a letter to send to the Forest Service to talk about detection, please do. It won't hurt anything. I'm just not convinced it will help anything. Uh, but Bill mentioned the mitigation efforts. Just about the entire east side of the community was done from Cristola up to King's Crown and beyond about five or six years ago. And then they switched their efforts to the west side of town. And so there have been many acres that have been masticated and cleared as part of this removal of the ladder fuels process. But we'll certainly take council's direction and, and, and move forward so that we can perhaps make things better. Well, I think we had to do that in concert with others because us alone, we're too small to have any effect on any large governmental organization. But as a community, a larger community with Colorado Springs and all that, if we get together and draft something as a huge community, that might have more of impact. Yeah, I don't know that, it, I don't know that it's going to have any impact at all because the Forest Service is dedicated to preserving the forest. So they're leaning forward to prevent fires anyway. So, I mean, we can, we can encourage it, but I'm not sure what benefit we'll do. Like I said, it won't hurt anything. David, I would like to add, too, that we recently updated with the county the hazard mitigation plan, uh, and fire was you know, the number one topic of discussion. And so there were a lot, a lot of players and people at the table for that. So that's been an ongoing effort over the last five years also. So. David, could we... Um at, at a minimum, get an update on uh, after action from Waldo Canyon uh, yep. at the next meeting. And I, and I asked for it at the next meeting because, if you recall, the anniversary of Waldo Canyon is 23 June. Um, so it would, it, it, even if it's just an update. And in terms of, of response, because it is kind of what I do for a living now, um, the city has um, a number of mechanisms to ask for immediate response, to include uh, requesting assistance from uh, the military facilities. However, that does not include the use of the C-130s. The C-130s have to be approved by the National Interagency Fire uh, Coordination Center up in Boise. And if you've gotten to that point, it's pretty bad. But in terms of um, Chinooks with buckets, those now exist at Carson. Uh, we have uh, 
the same opportunity that any community in the area does to ask for immediate response um, if necessary. And that usually occurs on a non-reimbursable basis. So that's, that's the goodwill of the commander at Carson or at uh, the Air Force Academy to, to bring whatever assets they can to bear. And I'm assuming we also have established memorandums of agreement with um, other uh, assets you know, like neighboring fire departments? Absolutely. During the Hayman fire, we um, can't recall what they're called, recipro reciprocal agreements. And we pulled in uh, even an engine company from Fort Carson. And two days later, we pulled in a combat heavy engineer battalion to help us build a fire break around the city. We didn't have to use it, but we've done this before. We know how to do it. But I would agree with you, Gary. Uh, the, the weak link is detection. That seemed to be part of the issue with the Waldo Cannon fire. And maybe as part of your presentation back to council, you could at least help us understand what is available now and, and help us understand where the gaps are if we do want to uh, take this as a, a formal action. Uh, Ken? I, I, on a personal note, and Gary and I both live, like many people in this community, um, bordering the National Forest. And I think there needs to be I, I've pursued this a little bit myself, and it gets to be, um, how should I say, a little cumbersome dealing with the National Forest people, but, you know, we, we can mitigate around our house, and then there's trees right there that we'd like to at least delimb, not cut them down, maybe delimb, do, how far back can we go? Get some ruling from somebody. Can we go 100 feet, 100 yards? Because um, it doesn't do a whole lot of good just to clear your lot when so many of us are bordering that, we need to go back into the woods a little ways. And they don't seem to understand that. They don't <coughs> seem to, they, they told me they need an environmental study. I said, I don't want to cut the trees down. I just want to delimb them up 10 feet or so. It didn't get anywhere. We're going to do a little research because I think it's in your area because uh, I'm only two ridges over from you that I think <coughs> five or six years ago they went through and did. Yes, they did a lot of great work. They did a great work. It's got to be beetle damage. From it. Yeah. It, it really was for both. It did. It solved a lot of issues as it related to fire damage too. So what what I think their philosophy was was create a swath of safety, and then there's an, another area that you're seeing from your house, and then they've got what the the urban area has done. Yeah, they did a wonderful job. I mean, probably several hundred trees behind us were cleaned out, and then he had somebody, a private contractor, come in and take out the dead ones that weren't beetle infested. They did a great job. But I'm just talking about the trees that are left. Right. Let's just delimb them. I mean, it seems like a minor thing. I hate to make a big deal out of it. But to me, so much of our community is surrounded by national forests. It'd be nice to get some clarification. What can we do without going through a lot of legal hassle? Okay. We can pursue that. Would it be possible to have a representative from Forest Service here at a future council meeting? We can try. Okay. <laughs> That's all we can do. All right. Thank you. Well, they uh, we pay their salaries. Yeah, you, but they're, we run into roadblocks with them all the time when we're talking about trying to reopen Rampart Range Road. It's one of my greatest That's frustrations and bills. And they've got four or five people for this region. Uh, you know, it's just a small number of people. It's incredibly small. There's a couple of people that are here very local that we work with very closely. We'll start with them. We'll see what we can do. Well, that's another issue about the Rampart Range Road. I don't think we've been forceful enough to make our views known that we need to get that open as a secondary route. Uh, I've uh, personally been pretty obnoxious, but I guess it's not that Well, and Not obnoxious enough, obviously. <laughs> there have been letters from the, the mayor. There have been letters from me. Uh, we, we'll, we continue to pursue it. Well, it's got to be larger than us. It's got to be, uh, <coughs> a, you know. A, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments has written letters to them as well. And it just isn't, we're not being successful. Well, then we've got to find out why we're not successful, because I think we need to do something that is successful. So I, I mean, I'm not, I don't try to do things to be unsuccessful. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is that, that we have taken it at least to the entire PPACG well, to Jerry Marr, and she has denied the request. Well, then we need to get back to her or her, her supervisor. Jerry, Jerry's okay. gone now. Good. Jerry. Then we need to pursue with the new person. We'll do that. So we will look forward to an update then at the 5th of June meeting. We'll be happy to provide it. Bob, on to pools. Yes, um, uh, as a uh, council liaison to the Woodland Aquatic Project Board of Directors, um, we had our meeting last night 
And uh, our primary concern of that meeting, other than getting new members and whatever, was uh, the uh, schedule that David had come out with uh, recently. It didn't appear to put the request for proposals near front. So, um, Jerry, our president, has contacted you. He tried to talk to you by phone today. I don't know the results of that. If you've got something update, other, you know, then uh, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and go sure. first. Thank you. No, I did not have a chance to speak with <coughs> Jerry this afternoon. The basically the, the the process that I shared with council was based on our discussion of bundling the the bonds to accomplish the three different projects: Memorial Park, Fleet Maintenance, and the Woodland Aquatic Project. It's no surprise that the community has wanted an aquatic project for a long, long time. It's also no surprise that the, the community was not in support of raising taxes to do that. So we've waited <coughs> patiently over the years until we could get to a point where we felt like we could fund this with uh, existing revenues, and we're at that point. And so what we're working on now is determining what the size of that bond package will be. I've got one equation and one unknown, and the one unknown is the size of the Woodland Aquatic project. The fleet maintenance facility, we're going to have a really strong estimate on that within a month. Same thing for Memorial Park. And then I also can figure out the ability that we have to service the debt and I can back into an amount that we would be able to fund for the aquatic project. And so that's the way that I'm going to approach this. So I'm waiting to get, and I, I'm quite confident that we can, uh, with that analysis, come up with a project that meets the, the, the requirements that the community wants for an aquatic facility. So I don't need to push the request for proposal because right now I don't, we don't even have the community's um, vote to bundle the bonds, and we have to get that because it's a, it's a Tabor issue. So we will we'll work the math and back into an ability to fund the aquatic project. And there are a couple of other moving parts, too, as you saw in here, some, some work with the DDA, some estimates as it relates to infrastructure and the like. Yes. Okay, um, well, that, that's the part that the board has concern with. And for any project, you <coughs> should have a, a detailed scope and cost estimate for that so that the voters know what they're voting for. Uh, it would be great to have renderings, drawings, floor plans, all of that stuff is part of a marketing package to sell this to people. If you're just saying, oh, it's something in the range of 8 to $10 million, we don't know what it is or anything, that, that makes it really hard for us to help sell this project to the community. Sure it does. If the council wants to cause me to allocate funding for that, that design, um, I would struggle doing that with this year's budget. Okay. So that, it, to me, that's, that's the, the critical step, is the funding for that design, or even for an initial scoping, hasn't been provided. It has for the other components. Well, Back on the 8th of October when we were talking about, right after the 3rd of October meeting when you had the community strongly in support of this, the following week we met to talk about how we were going to use the excess contingency funds when we <coughs> moved the 10% down to 10%. And at that time you said you had sufficient funds without having to do a different li separate line item, not only for Gary's project for the Main Street program, but all for, so for the aquatic project you had sufficient funds to do the concept design. This was then followed by a meeting in 18 November when the mayor asked council members whether there was anybody who had any concerns with the project other than the funding. If the funding was over, with, with, and we all agreed at the time we needed to move out with the concept design to, in fact, identify what the funding was. So uh, the council has given pre previous direction to you, or guidance, or whatever you want to call it, to proceed with the concept design. Now we realize that there are some things that <clears throat> we needed to do with you, and we've been working, the, the Woodland Aquatic Board of Directors has been working with you for several years now in that process. And so on the 8th of January, we met, the board met with you to go over the RFP, and we agreed to the, the changes that need to be done, and you said you would go ahead and make those changes. Now, we identified at that meeting the critical thing was where was it going to be located. And at the time, you, uh, you took action on that and, and immediately found uh, the property uh, the, the over from the school district as a potential solution. All of this, however, came together 
at our goals and objectives meeting when we all agreed that probably the best site which would really help the DDA too as far as being getting that going was to have the site at the DDA property and also at the goals and objectives meeting we confirmed that there's funds within the existing funds. So board concerns about <coughs> or council concerns about the funding basically were addressed. Now of course we have to get voter approval of it. But two, the location was agreed. So there's nothing really to block the release of the RFP. Now there are several aspects other than just the promotional aspects of selling this project to the community which involves showing them some details on this. But <clears throat> if you're going to go right after the vote and go out to try to get bond packages, one of the prerequisites that bond brokers need <laughs> is a de pretty good estimate and scope of what, do, what is it you're going to build. You need to have a bond marketing package, okay? And so therefore, it's got to be done before November anyway if you're going to go immediately after that to produce, get, get bonds. The, the other aspect is that with this concept design, you will have a guaranteed maximum price. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages. In fact, procedurally, if you're going to do a capital investment project, just as we did for Memorial Park, we've spent $25,000 to defend the scope of that. You spent money on the vehicle maintenance facility to define the scope of that. It's logical to have the similar thing for the aquatic project, to ha not backing into numbers. It's not like, okay, I'm going to spend $10 million and I got to spend this much for the vehicle maintenance and uh, this much for Memorial Park, and therefore this is what's left for the aquatic project. That's backwards. That's not the way you do project management and program management. So I would, I'm going to make a motion uh, at task, tasking you to, in fact, uh, issue the RFP as soon as possible uh, so that we can come up with this critical, these critical numbers. But if you have any uh, discussion you want to make before I make that motion, I'd be glad to hear it. If, if I could, um, we can entertain a motion tonight <coughs> to in fact direct our city manager to make that expense. I think all of us had considered that that expense for a design plan would have to be accomplished before we went to a, a bond vote. Um, but Bob, would would you be willing to do, or would the council be willing to do, a uh, uh, working meeting? What would we, an, in order, or not a working meeting? A work session? A work session, session <coughs> in order to, to get a little more finite on this. Well, when it comes to the cost, <clears throat> we've, we've talked about that too on the 18th of November. Um, when we had the bidders conference with, with the bidders, they had estimated the cost of this would be between thirty and 40000 David at the time thought it could be as much as 80000 But in comparison to the $25,000 we spent for a million dollar memorial park, the 80000 is for a $7 million, $6 million, $7 million project is very inconsequential. We're not talking about doing the final design here. I, just, I, I, I hear you, and I, and I no. would just caution: don't, don't, com don't compare apples and oranges. Okay. I'm, I just mean, I, I, I'm understanding where you're coming from in terms of uh, proportionality, but um, if, if Bob, if you want to move forward with a motion, that would cause us. I mean, we have two two legal problems with that. Um, we are required under open meetings laws to have on our agenda the business items that the council is going to vote on. So you you could have a, a non-binding, head-nodding consensus mm -hmm. sort of action, but you wouldn't be able to take action on that matter without putting it on a published agenda and taking it up um, after you've done so. The second concern, and to the extent that you'd be appropriating funds mm -hmm. that you did not appropriate in last uh, approval of your budget, um, then that is, you, you need to follow your charter requirements on how to press it. So let me make a couple of comments because I, I don't disagree with everything you said. I do disagree with some things. But when the discussion was held in October and November, uh, 
I believe we were talking about thirteen dollars finishing up the year, mm -hmm. not looking to twenty fourteen. That's mm -hmm. correct, but it was talking about the monies in right. twenty thirteen right. that were residual from our execution of the twenty thirteen budget. Right. So the monies could have been available then. But then we're, we transitioned into the 14 budget. That was the we, November meeting. So we absolutely, uh, the council allocated funds to do the design for fleet maintenance and for Memorial Park. So that, and those are rocking and rolling, and uh, we're probably at 95% on both of those. But it's my recollection that we didn't allocate any funds for any component of the aquatic center for execution in 2014. Now, and so we, we moved forward with the 2014 budget and we, we brought everything down so that we would have that 10% reserve without any monies being spent for the Aquatic Center. So if the council wants to have a consensus or nod of the head or at some point in the future, then we're gonna need to adjust the budget to do that. And I just don't know that it's a necessary step. I, I understand your logic. It's not the most, uh, 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 it's not the best way to approach determining the funding. But what I'm, I'm confident in doing is that by doing the math, we can, we can determine what size that package can be. And then if at that point, if the council wants to dedicate that money to get the concept drawing so that we have that marketing plan, we can. The one thing that we, I don't know that we would have to do is we would not have to immediately go into the bond market for um, right after the election. Plus, our, our bond council has told us we don't have to have the in-depth design or even the huge concept. We have to have just the general concept, and I think we can, we can do that in a reasonable time. So that's, that's my struggle is that it, I didn't think I had the full council guidance as part of the 2014 budget to spend monies on the Aquatic Center. If the council wants to, to direct me in a different direction, we'll just have to look and see how we make that happen. I mean, I, it, we're making great progress here with this whole concept. No, I, I, I like that we're making some progress. It's just that I like to follow normal process and practice too. But well, normal any, process from your experience <coughs> may be different than normal process in the whole, or a wide range of programs, but um, or even our own programs. You have got a sure. more park design, okay? So we're, what we're doing, but at that meeting on 18 November, for which there is no record, um, Gary Bravetto asked for 60 million dollars for his downtown. Uh, hmm? Main Street program. There were a number of things. $60, 60 million? dollars. $60,000. Sorry about that. I didn't uh, ask for $60,000. I think uh, the figure was 10000 Okay. As but, if I remember correctly. But there were some other requests. <clears throat> and that's, by the way, <clears throat> that's not for one specific project. When you talk about 10000 on the Main Street, right. that, that, that to the advantage of everybody in the community, not just one section of the community. Okay. Because um, that's part of economic let, development. Let, let, me, let me bring bring this back in. Okay. What... I am certain of is that we did not have a budget line for any I expense agree with uh, yeah. associated. We collectively agreed that that was going to happen mm -hmm. at some point, but we also collectively agreed that we would, we, by law, have to take this to a, a vote uh, for a bond or this for taxes. It was on the agenda tonight. No, it was not on the agenda. I, I, I offered uh, the council member uh, an opportunity to talk about what's happening with <coughs> the Aquatic <coughs> Project Board. Um, I don't think, it, it, as, as uh, Aaron has already pointed out, this is not a motion that we can make tonight. Okay. Uh, but if you want to do a work session where we can work out the details of the PERC diagram and a way ahead with bun a bond bundling vote, then we'll, work, we'll do that if the council members are willing to spend that additional time to do so, yes. but not at the meeting tonight. Okay. But I did, I mean, David suggested that if there was, you know, absent a motion, but there was a nod of assent or something like there, that. We still can't do a okay. nod or assent on a, a line item in the budget. Well, I did ask David to put it. this on the agenda in my, uh, my message at the well, end Well, what I'm, I'm asking for a nod or consent from the council if we would like to do a work session in the very near future. Yes. Let David do his magic with scheduling yes. and we'll work okay. through this detail. Well, I would like to have a special session 
so that this, in fact, is is recorded. I'm on the not record. sure what a special it's, session would it's, accomplish. It's one of the three types of meetings that are called for in our ordinance, our, our quote charter: okay. regular meetings, special meetings, and executive okay. sessions. So I, I would prefer a special session in, in the immediate future, okay. if possible. We'll let David do his um, yeah. scheduling magic then, and we will, at the re recommendation of Councilman. Uh, Carlson uh, asked for a special session for the purpose of discussing the way ahead with a bond bundling. Um, and that could yeah, cover I'd like everything. To know what, what's should... the desired outcome? Why are we? Why? What is the intent? <coughs> well, well, the intent is then to, to get a decision to move ahead with the RFP, but also any other questions that people may have on your schedule. Okay. okay. All right. Then we'll look forward to. Um, time spent discussing this so problem is important okay Ken Nothing. Nothing. no yes I have three things that was exciting though thanks Bob <coughs> brought the temperature up in the room uh, I went to a Parks and Rec meeting uh, that was my first it was very nice uh, we need volunteers for all the sports, so if any parents out there have little ones and they want to volunteer as coaches, uh, contact Brooks and Rec. Uh, the other thing is the Teen Center. Uh, my son goes to the Teen Center. Uh, it's a nice little, little. it's right behind City Hall here. Uh, looking for, uh, they were talking about donations, looking for donations, maybe some football, frisbees, because summer is coming. and. There's going to be a lot more, they said, on the average 60 kids a day <coughs> that go through the teen center. That's a lot. And yesterday or two days ago I was there and there was maybe 20. So we're looking for some donations to help out because they're, they're short on sports equipment. Before we ask for donations, I, I need, I'll talk to our teen center coordinator okay. and that, that chain of command. Sure. Um, I would like to understand what the scope of the needs are. And to see if there's if if we can t take care of that okay. without asking the community for donations. If they want to donate pizzas or yeah. sodas or things like that, but for the equipment for the programs, we right. need to look at that internally. Okay, I, I didn't know that, so okay, thank you. Uh, that clarifies. I did buy them pizza. <laughs> thank you. And I did you get a nice me. a nice little card with all the kids uh, signing it. So that was another thing. Is the Lions Club? I had a chance to sit down with uh, the members of the Lions Club and. <coughs> I just want to promote it a little bit here. Uh, a lot of people don't know about the Lions Club. Uh, if you head out 67, right when you get out of town, you have uh, off to the left, you see a big sign that says Lions Club. And I don't know if you've ever driven back there, but it's a beautiful camp, beautiful camp. And they're looking for some members. So I just want to read up what the Lions Club does. In fact, I believe the Lions, don't we have a park named yeah. after the Lions? Correct. Right. Yeah, with all the flags. Uh, the Lions Camp, they actually sponsor special needs campers. I didn't know that. They're helping with expenses, events, and upkeep. Uh, pennies for people. So if you go some, to some of the establishments there, you see a little thing. Throw in your extra change. It helps. They, they count it down to the penny. It's, it's quite impressive. Uh, individuals with vision problems. So the donkey basketball. That was pretty fun. We all went to that. Uh, all those proceeds go to kids sight screening for preschoolers, Rocky Mountain Eye Bank, providing eye exams for glasses. Uh, they also have youth programs, flags for first graders, peace poster programs, scholarships, so we're working on that. We're going to try to get some scholarships for the kids. Uh, Woodland Park, Lions Park, we just uh, talked to American Cancer Society, and also they support other Pikes Peak area, area charities. Uh, if you'd like to become a member, member, you can get a hold of Scott Davis. Uh, I don't know. Can I say the number? Seven one nine two one three four one one eight. That's all I have to say. Oh, Teen Center hours will change to two to six. Thank Thanks, you. Noel. I would just add to that, even though I'm a Kiwanis member. <laughs> uh, um, I think the Lions uh, group still collects <coughs> used glasses. Friends. Yes, yes, but they do and collect that, used glasses. Yeah, and sure. just make sure everybody knows that it's, right. a, it's a good use that they do. Um, you can also just search on, let's see, Google, go to Google Pikes Peak Lions and look for Woodland Park Pikes Peak Lions Club and you can get all your information there. 
That's not Thank you. John. Nothing. All righty. City Attorney. Thank you. And City Manager. No, ma'am. Not a thing. Any of our other department heads? No, ma'am. Yes. She. Just one. Like I said. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the Kiwanis Club recognizes uh, law enforcement employees once a year from Woodland Park, Crip Creek, and the Sheriff's Department. They recognized Beverly Hodges for her work with the Woodland Park Teen Court uh, all last year. And that was all I had to say. Thanks. <coughs> Okay, if we have nothing else, so that adjourns the meeting. Okay. <coughs>